Safety and warning labels are a necessity for keeping consumers and employees aware of any dangerous situations that may arise. Whether it's unsafe aspects of work equipment or a product itself, clearly identified and legible safety and warning labels will keep those susceptible aware of the potential hazards. In September 1998, Greg Roach and his co-worker, Gordon Faulkner, two Ohio carpet installers were severely burned when the adhesive they were using, Parachem's Parabond M280 all-weather outdoor adhesive, ignited at their job location, exploding into a fireball which traveled up the basement stairs, blew out the kitchen window, and ignited a neighbor's tree. The tragedy of this whole accident is it could have been easily avoided. Simple product warnings, plainly visible, would have prevented this horrific event. And that's why the jury awarded Greg and Gordon Faulkner $8 million, which the Ohio 9th District Court of Appeals later upheld. The awful truth is that Parachem once had adequate label warnings, but deliberately decided to remove them. In this insider-exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, our news team visits with Brian Zimmerman of B. Zimmerman Law in Canton, Ohio, to go behind the headlines to see the challenges and dangers all workers face every day in the workplace and what their rights are. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Canton, Ohio. It is my great pleasure to introduce Brian Zimmerman to the show. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you, Steve. We're here today talking about another case of yours, your client, Greg Roach. Tell our audience a little bit about who Greg is. I, I didn't meet him until after he was severely injured. Uh, but before I met him, he was a carpet installer. He was a father. Uh, he was engaged to be married. Uh, he was a hard worker. Um, just somebody, a normal guy, trying to live a normal life. And um, what happened with his case? What, what was this all about? Oh, well, one day he and his uh, co-worker, uh, Gordy, um, they were given a job to install indoor-outdoor carpeting in a customer's basement. And they were given the indoor-outdoor carpeting, they loaded it in their van, and they were also given outdoor carpet adhesive to install the carpet with. So they traveled to their client's home. She was an elderly woman. She, they went down to her basement. <clears throat> they got the basement all prepared to put in this outdoor, indoor outdoor carpeting. And they began to spread the glue uh, that were, they were going to use on the floor to install the carpeting. Um, what they didn't realize was that this outdoor carpet adhesive contained explosive vapors um, and those vapors build up in the basement and the homeowner, customer, was using the uh, upst upstairs kitchen sink and had the hot water running and it caused the hot water tank in the basement to kick on and that flame ignited those vapors in the basement and a fireball explosion occurred that literally picked up uh, Greg, uh, my client, and his co-worker, picked them up, threw them all the way back against the back wall of the basement. And they, when they came to, they saw the basement was engulfed in flames. What they didn't realize was that that fireball that had originally occurred went and traveled up the stairwell blew the, the door open at the top of the stairs, traveled across the kitchen, went and blew the kitchen window out, traveled across the driveway and caught the neighbor's tree on fire. So back 
in the basement, Greg and Gordy are trapped in this fire, and the only thing that Greg can think of is, I have to get out of here. So he starts to run towards the stairwell and trips over the rolled up carpet that they were gonna install, and he falls into this, what I describe as burning napalm, and he cannot get up. That's the adhesive. That's the adhesive, and he's completely covered in this, completely now engulfed in flames and this adhesive. Fortunately, Gordy, his co-worker, saw him, ran into the fire, grabbed Greg by the back of his pants, and literally pulled him up the stairs. When these two men emerged to the outside of the house, neighbors described them as burning candles. They, their skin was literally dripping off of them, and they were just melting in front of the neighbors. Uh, fortunately, one neighbor did grab a garden hose and was able to spray them with the water and put them out, but it was just devastating injuries. What happened immediately after that, after they went to the hospital? And I think Greg was put into a medically induced coma, wasn't he? Yes. Five months? Greg uh, had suffered um, second and third degree burns over approximately 69% of his body. Every bone uh, in his fingers was exposed. Um, he was uh, medically uh, put into a coma for 55 days because the burns were so severe. And that's to allow him to heal better. Yes, because of the swelling and the pain. And burns are really the worst kind of injuries one can suffer because you don't just suffer the burn, but then you have to go through the painful treatment of where they take a basically a wire brush to your skin and scrub off all of the dead tissue because of infection and it's our skin that protects us from infection so it's just a very long and painful uh, journey to try to recover from those kind of injuries. Now you had told me before that anybody in this kind of a situation gets really depressed and he had kind of like given up Yes. because a lot of people might think that it was his fault that they put the adhesive down there, et cetera, right? He eventually ended up contacting you. What was your strategy to get them justice? Um, the first strategy was to send the label because this, as I said, this was outdoor adhesive and clearly marked on the front of the label said extremely flammable. So my first thought was, well, he took extremely flammable adhesive into a basement um, is there a case here at all? So I sent the label to approximately 10 different experts to get their opinion. Every single expert rejected the case and said, No case. No case. It said extremely flammable. He should have known. So let's bring up another T, training. <laughs> Did he have training for this? He did have training, and I think it's important to note that this glue had been provided to him by his employer. He did not select this glue at the store. But once I, but I believed in Greg, and when Greg came to me, I, I, I knew he wasn't stupid. I knew there was a reason that he must have taken this glue inside, so I went to a Home Depot myself and started looking at different adhesives, and I found an identical adhesive that was made by a company named Henry who made the identical outdoor adhesive. And the one thing that I noticed immediately when I saw this was that they had a label on the lid of their product that was bright red lettering, had an explosion symbol on top of it, and they said, do not use this indoors because it can explode. Where the glue that Greg used exploded, but they did not have a similar warning. But from my understanding, they did have a similar warning previously. Yes. And they took it off. Yes. Because of your investigation. Yes. Over a 20-year period, we discovered that the uh, glue that Greg was using had all kinds of warnings to say, don't use indoors, keep away from electrical outlets, the vapors may explode. All the, literally 20 separate serious warnings were re, uh, removed from this label and the only warning that was left on was a six point type warning that said do not use indoors because of flammability. Right. Was, did you ever find out the reason why they basically removed it? We never got an admission of why yeah. but we always just 
thought it was because they were trying to sell their product and the more dangers that you have listed on your product, the less likely somebody's going to buy it. So you were able to get uh, the previous labels, Yes. compare them to the current label, and I, I'll bet you that was pretty persuasive with the jury. Yeah, and the other thing that was really persuasive with the jury was the two major ingredients in this glue that Greg was using was uh, naphtha and I think Naxidone, and both of the product, the, when those products are used, they come with product safety or material safety data sheets that warn of the dangers of those products. In both of those material safety data sheets, it warned that if this product was spilled into a river, that you had to evacuate everybody downstream because of the fear of an outdoor explosion. Right. That's how dangerous this is. You know, in all these cases, um, lawyers hope that as a result of, and you got a verdict of $8 million for both of both uh, the men, um, they hope that the defendant changes their behavior. They, have they, do they still sell a similar product? Is the warning much bigger? I have not seen their product. Um, it's Paracam. Yes, it's it Paracam. I have not seen their product since the case, so I, I hope they change. Yeah. But unfortunately, I don't know. So, um, you know, whenever you go into a court case, it's a battle. The other side is going to be saying things, well, these guys should have known. There was labels on there. So what if it was only six-point font, okay? Um, how do you counter that? Well, I think uh, you the way to better counter it is to show what a competitor does. Yeah. And in that, that's what we did in this case. We show what the major competitor of Paracam, how they warn. Henry. Yes. Did you bring in anybody from Henry, from their company? Yes, we actually found a former employee of Henry that lived in Fullerton, California, and we brought him in to testify, and he was very effective. My question is, former employee, nobody from the company would come in? No. Because they all want to stick together. They do, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, uh, but the, the warning says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And I'll bet you that was very convincing with the jury. The jury came in with an $8 million award. Yes, and what's interesting, Steve, is in Ohio, you have, in a civil trial, you have eight jurors, and you have to have six of the eight come to a conclusion. In this case, after about two hours, the jury came back and said they had a defense verdict in favor of Paracam, yeah. but the judge became angry and said, I told you it takes six and there's only five of you that have found in favor of Paracam, so go back. Yeah. Three days later, they came back with a eight or six to eight, uh, six to two verdict in favor of Greg and Gordy in the amount of eight million. So you brought up another interesting point about the company when they sent these two workers out, your clients, when they sent them out, um, they gave them this adhesive, right? Yes. That was probably a pretty persuasive factor. They had been given the tools that needed to do, and they all knew this was an inside job, right? Yes. An indoor job. Yes. Um, did you call anybody from that company about why they had given them the wrong adhesive? No. Um, the reason we didn't do that is because we were trying to show that the the label on the product itself was inadequate, and so it would have been inadequate not only to Greg and Gordy, but also to the people that gave it to him. In these types of cases, what is a manufacturer's duty to the consumer to make sure that they're protected? The argument that we made and we believe that the law has established is that when there is a hidden danger, something that can cause serious bodily harm or injury or property damage, that the, the uh, manufacturer must conspicuously warn of those dangers so that someone, a consumer, is adequately warned and protected. Uh, oftentimes a company will, like for example, Greg's company, um, I don't know, did you include them as a defendant? We did not. Okay, but oftentimes a company will say, we gave them sufficient training. Yes. Does that cut it if the labeling isn't right? No, because no amount of training uh, can teach you that a product is dangerous unless the manufacturer of that product warns you of that. It was an $8 million verdict. How is that determined? Well, in this case, you look at the medical bills. Uh, uh, Greg's medical uh, bills alone were well over $2 million. Uh, and he had over 18 major surgeries. And I know he's had surgeries since then. He's had tissue expanders put into his uh, neck. In fact, when we were in trial, he had 
a balloon in his neck to expand the tissue so that that tissue could be then harvested to put on his face. Yeah, yeah and he went through trial like that. And so the jury got to see what he was literally living through and going through. So they got to see his medical damages. We also presented uh, information of future medical costs and his pain and suffering and his disfigurement. Um, and how does that affect, for example, when you're looking at economic damages? You know, somebody who's been burned over their body, what was it, 96%? Yeah. You know, they, they, there are certain professions and jobs they can't get because, you know, they look sometimes so hideous, right? We had uh, his plastic surgeon testify and this was a man who had treated many, many people who had been burned. And he remembered that when Greg first entered the hospital, after he came out of his uh, drug-induced coma, I mentioned to you that he had a son. He didn't want his son to see him. And when the doctor started describing this for the jury, he literally broke down and started crying and said, Imagine not even wanting your own child to see you. And, you know, that's what Greg went through. How's Greg doing today? He's doing amazing. Uh, the doctors gave him zero chance of ever being able to walk again. Not only can he walk, he can run. He's gainfully employed. He's married, living a good life. Good, and you helped him, you know. Well, I'm. Fortunate. I'm so impressed with the fact that 10 experts in the labeling business said you ain't got no case. <laughs> you know, one final question. When people come to your office, they have been injured, how do you decide whether you want to represent them? Well, and for using Greg as an example, uh, you believe in the person, you believe in what happened to them, and you believe that they deserve justice, and then you fight for them as hard as you can. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.